are about ready to get started. <laughs> Jason, are you ready? Okay, well I want to welcome everyone tonight to, this is actually our second talk on Healthy Brains for a Healthy Oklahoma. And I am Dr. Amanda Morris, and I'm at Laureate Institute for Brain Research, and I'm also at Oklahoma State University. And I'm a developmental psychologist, and I also am the parent of two tweens. And I'm really excited tonight to talk to you about this developmental period, because as much as it can be stressful for parents and for kids, it can also be a really special time. And so, Tonight I want to take about an hour to really talk about and think about what we know about the brain and how it develops during this developmental period, but also to talk about how we can help um, parent and navigate these tweens through this period, because it can actually be a really wonderful special time, and you can often think about it as a time of opportunity. So that's the way I like to frame it. So we'll get started. Um, I do want to make sure everybody knows this is not going to be a two-hour talk. Um, there will be time for questions. We have snacks. So this will be about 45 minutes. We have some video clips that hopefully our sound will work on. But um, just really glad that you all are here tonight. And please feel free at any point if you have a question, just raise your hand. This is, um, this is sort of an informal talk. So. I want to make sure that everybody understands what we're talking about. Um, if you have questions, just let me know. Again, we are doing these talks for the community, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in, later. But again, this is supposed to be um, some place where you can learn and ask questions. So I want to just start by acknowledging my colleagues. Um, certainly here at, at OSU, I have several colleagues, and some of you guys can raise your hands. Go ahead. Um, who have helped with some of this research, and also colleagues at LIBOR who you'll see some of their names. Um, certainly the research that I'm presenting could not be done without students in our lab. And um, the research that I'm presenting is also funded by various organizations, uh, the National Institutes of Health, Oklahoma Center for the Advancement of Technology um, in Science, and then the USDA. And I have several things listed here. Hopefully everybody got a handout. So if you want more information, I have some of my primary sources up here where I've taken some of this information and, and condensed it. Um, but again, feel free to ask me about any of my sources if you have further questions. So what I'm going to do tonight is give you an overview. I'm going to talk about brain science, tell you a little bit about what we know about the brain and how we study it, but I'm not going to be too sciencey. So we're not going to get into too much stuff, but I want to tell you a little bit more about that. I want to talk about what are tweens, how do we define them, what makes this a unique developmental period. We're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the brain of teens and or in tweens and how that affects their behavior, and then also how we can help develop and navigate that period. And then at the end I have some tips from some experts, and these experts are actually tweens. Um, during my carpool this, uh, this week, um, I had the opportunity to be with quite a number of tweens, and so I asked them their advice. What would you tell parents? What is it like? And I'll share that with you at the end. And again, we'll have time for questions later on. So in terms of brain science, what do we know, and how has the field really developed in the last 10 to 20 years? Um, I'm showing you here uh, an fMRI scanner, and this is actually a scanner. We have something just like this at LIBOR, and um, it's really changed the way that we think about brain development and about the brain. When I was in graduate school and even an undergraduate, um, I learned that all of the neurons that you will ever have, you are born with. Now we know that neurons are constantly changing and growing, and the brain is growing throughout um, our lives. Um, and also, we know that the brain continues to develop. Um, also, it was, a, it was thought that when the brain is the size of an adult, which is in early adolescence, that it's fully developed. Well, we know that that is not the case. And in fact, the more that we learn about the brain, we're understanding that brain development actually goes into the mid-20s. 
And the way that we know that is because of advances like uh, fMRI. How many of you have had an MRI before? Just at the hospital, magnes magnetic resonant imaging. And what happens is this allows us to take pictures. Um, in, in particular, we're interested in pictures of the brain. And functional MRI tells us what areas of the brain are being activated during different tasks. So an MRI can tell us structurally how the brain is changing over time and with development, and functionally what is going on in terms of different tasks and different behaviors. We have the ability with an fMRI to actually show videos and play different tasks. It's like playing video games in a scanner where we look at things like um, how children respond to different facial expressions, how they respond to different tasks with rewards or gambling, and we want to see what areas of the brain, actually we call it lighting up, but it's how much oxygen um, and blood flow is going to different areas of the brain. So fMRI has allowed us to be able to study not only how brains change over time, structurally, size, shape, different areas developing, but also how they function and what areas are developing. Um, and again, we know that brains develop now into the mid-20s. Um, and what I think is really interesting, and if we think about it, it makes sense, but everything we do every day affects our brain, every experience. So our brains are constantly changing. So all of our experiences, that everything we encounter is affecting our brain. It's affecting the connections in the brain. It's affecting how our brains process information. And we have 100 billion neurons. So there's a little YouTube video that I'm not going to show, but it's on your handout, that we actually show to children who are part of our studies here at LIBOR on what it's like to be part of an fMRI study. So if you have a chance, uh, you can check that out later. This is actually pictures of, um, some of you might know my daughter Molly, who was 10 going on 11. She was one of our first pilot um, participants in, our, in one of our studies here. And these are pictures of her brain. And I can see her little profile. I think it's so cute. Um, but um, what we're doing here at LIBOR, at Laureate Institute for Brain Research, is really neuroscience-based research um, that's clinical and developmental in nature. So we are really under, interested in understanding basic development, but also applying that to predict mental health, to understand treatment and interventions, and to really be able to assess those interventions. So we do different kinds of studies here. I'll tell you more a little bit at the end. But again, um, we are actually really interested in looking at how the brain changes and these different images of the brain, which are really, within the last 15 years, we haven't had this kind of technology. So it's really changed very rapidly. So what are the tweens? How many of you have what we would call a tween, which is um, a 10 to 12 year old, or somewhere around, I see some people, okay. Um, how many of you can remember when you were 10 to 12? It's really not changed that much, except that everybody has these phones now. Um, so you can think about the tweens, and it was kind of a popular term, which is between childhood and adolescence, that bridging period, 10 to 12. Um, we can think about it as late elementary or early middle school. And something that happens during the tween years is puberty. It's sort of a, a, a big piece of that. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but we think about it as developmental scientists and developmental psychologists. We call that early adolescence. So we think of, and when we st study and teach adolescence in, in a class, like at OSU um, or anywhere, any university, adolescence is really considered the second decade of life. So starting at age 10 all the way through 20. And we've even been extending this into emerging adulthood, and we realize now that even our um, young 20s and late adolescents really are still not fully developed, particularly as we understand what's going on with brain development. So um, some of the research that I'll be presenting is on adolescents more broadly, but I'm trying really hard to focus on that narrow period bete between 10 to 12, which you can think of as early adolescence or the transition from childhood to adolescence. So in terms of tweens, I have a couple of quotes that I want to highlight that I think really capture the developmental period very well. And um, we'll watch a clip from this movie in a little bit, from Inside Out, which I think is a wonderful movie if you haven't seen it. But this was actually in an article, and Pete Docter, who was the creator of the film Inside Out, 
said, my daughter is changing, he thought, when his daughter Ellie was 11, that's the age of the, of the little girl in the movie. She used to have this happy, goofy spirit, but she began to move toward being more quiet and reclusive. And then he goes on to say, kids grow up, and it's sad, and it's beautiful, and it's necessary. And I really think that quote right there captures those tween periods. It's beautiful, it's a little bit sad, but it's important. Um, there was also a, a recent study that came out in developmental science um, by some colleagues at, at uh, University of Arizona and Arizona State who s surveyed over 2,200 moms, and these moms had children all ages, infants to early adulthood, and they identified middle school, which kind of encompasses part of that tween time, as the most stressful time. The mothers reported feeling empty and lonely and less fulfilled in life. And um, the authors talk about why this might be. And some of it is, you know, kids are growing up earlier. We know that in some ways. But also, it's just naturally, developmentally, a time of a lot of change. So when we get to the end of the talk, we'll talk about some of that change and how that affects relationships and how we can work through those changes that are very normal. I'm not going to show that video clip, but I am going to talk a little bit more about brain development before we move on. So I think what's important to understand, and this is about brain development in general, particularly I'm focusing on um, the teenage years, but also all of development that happens. Um, particularly during the adolescent period, is the brain develops from the back forward. And that's really important to understand, that it develops from the back forward. And so in the back, and if you can see, if I can, oh, whoops, if I can get my little pointer here. So this part here, the cerebellum, is important in physical coordination. This is developing first. So kids are really active, they need to be active. Um, and this is doing really well in terms of development. Then we move to more the middle of the brain here. We see the nucle nucleus accumbens, which we'll talk a little bit more about. It's very um, involved in reward processing. Um, the amygdala, where we process emotions. Um, and then the prefrontal cortex. That develops last. So the brain, this is getting really developed. And even um, th some research that the nucleus accumbens is enlarged during um, early adolescence. And then the prefrontal cortex, which is the judgment or the executive center. So what you can tell right now that something that people have known for a long time is that our reward, our sensation seeking is really active during adolescence. And then our ability to be able to control that does not come online until much later. Actually, the mid-20s. Okay? So there's so many implications here. I want to talk a little bit more about the prefrontal cortex. It's this front part of the brain. Um, it's involved in decision making. We can think about it as the executive center of the brain. It's involved, it helps us regulate our emotions. It helps the development of empathy and perspective taking. So if you may think, oh, my tween or my teenager doesn't seem to get my perspective or isn't very empathic, well, their brain is not fully there yet. Um, sorry. Uh, it helps us be able to understand the consequences of our behavior, to think about our future, and to think about and plan for the future. Um, it's involved in regulating emotions and behaviors, and in self-awareness. So this executive center of the brain that helps us control our impulses, helps us control our emotions, is not developed until uh, into later adolescence and fully developed into our mid-20s. So, this is all really new research within the last five to ten years. Morality is the last one there. So, um, we, they, you know, I think there are implications here, but one of them is that we need to be the prefrontal cortex. Okay, and that's what um, some of the researchers on um, parenting and, and brain development say. Parents, you need to be that. You're going to have to help because their prefrontal cortex is not fully developed, so we need to help them to regulate and to help them make good decisions by putting limits in place, et cetera. So in terms of some, some changes that I want to highlight and go into a little bit more depth about is um, structural changes in the brain that occur. So the brain is actually remodeled 
and changed through what we call synaptic pruning. And the synapses are all the connections between the neurons within the brain. And what happens during adolescence is that those, um, it, you can sort of think about it as this, the, the, you lose it or use it or lose it. So all those different experiences are strengthening those connections within the brain. And what is happening is that the brain is actually becoming more efficient. So we're losing these, we call it pruning, but it's like pruning a rose bush. You're taking off what's not being used, and the brain is actually becoming much more efficient. You can think about it as a system of super highways of connection. So it's becoming more functional and more efficient. And what's really interesting is that every experience that we have, and, and particularly during adolescence and early adolescence, strengthens these roads, these highways, these pathways. And so the experiences, what kids are experiencing at home, at school, are really firming up those connections, those super highways, those pathways. So experience is very important. What's also interesting is that early adolescence and all of adolescence is what we call a term of great plasticity within the brain. The brain is as plastic as, as it would be in infancy and early childhood. So um, what we mean by plasticity, if you think about plastic, it's moldable, okay? So it is very moldable, very changeable. Um, as we get older, our, be our brain becomes less what we would call plastic. And so um, everything that we do during adolescence is shaping our brain literally. Um, the brain is much more responsive to experiences. There are some great things about the brain being plastic. Um, it makes it um, more malleable and adaptable, more changeable, and more open to positive experiences. But at the same time, negative experiences have a lot of weight as well. Um, you can think about brain development in terms of the three R's. Um, so during the teenage years, we see major changes in the reward system, the relationship system, and the regulatory system. So the reward system is changing, and we see um, increases in dopamine. Um, dopamine is the neurotransmitter that is released when we think about money, when we think about sex, when we think about sweets. When we show people in the scanner pictures of sweets or money, we see a dopamine release. Um, it's more active during adolescence. Um, the relationship system is changing. Um, the way that adolescents process relationships is changing. It's very much based on reward. They don't have that full ability to perspective take, but they're very influenced by peers, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, and as I mentioned before, the regulatory system is not fully developed until the mid-20s. So here are the different phases. And, and, and you know, I don't want to be a naysayer, so this is not all bad. It can be a really fun, wonderful time, too. Um, think about it, if your reward systems were going all the time and, you know, you had all, all this excitement in life, it can be a good thing. Um, phase one starts during puberty. And um, you can think about this, and this is from um, the a um, Age of Opportunity, Larry Steinberg's book, of that's starting the engines. And so you see emotional highs and lows. It's triggered by puberty. You um, are much more sensitive to the opinions of others especially peers, and um, you know, if you think about that from an evolutionary perspective, puberty is when we're uh, evolutionarily the time that you leave the home, that you're to go out and find another home, find a mate, and so our bodies are wired so that we care about other people outside of our immediate family, and we're really in tune with that. That's biologically um, adaptive although it may not be as adaptive now and we want our kids to stay home until they're um, in their mid-20s. Um, but um, it's, it's also a time when um, kids are more determined to have exciting and intense experiences. Okay, that reward center is online. Um, there's a lot of sensation seeking that occurs. So, you know, you want that to happen through good things through sports, through skiing, through, you know, uh, controlled things, because there are a lot of ways to have sensation seeking that may not be healthy. 
Phase two, which actually does start in pre-adolescence through age 16, is they're getting better at regulating their emotions. That breaking system, that prefrontal cortex is developing. It's not all the way there yet. Um, but, you know, there's hope as you get closer to 16. Um, but then phase three, which is not completed until the mid-20s, is when you're really like that skilled driver. So we have the engine starting. We got the braking system, but it's not very good yet. You know, that's why you need the parents, or you know, in driver's ed, you had the other. Does anybody remember having that driver who could step on the brakes for you? I, I remember that happening to me a lot when I was in driver's ed. So you, got, you have that other person that has to help with your braking system, and then you're really not a fully skilled driver of that system until the mid-20s. So all of this is triggered, as I was saying earlier, by puberty. And what happens during puberty is that the brain is transformed as actually what we would call bathed in sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen. Um, and that is triggering all of these changes. And so these hormones are stimulating neurons, they're stimulating the pruning, this process to take place, and they make the brain more plastic, more amenable, and more open to experience. Um, these hormones also trigger that dopamine, that reward, um, and the pathway, the circuitry that carry messages about reward are really strong, okay? So it's increasing that reward circuitry that um, is actually making this period very sensitive to reward. Now I want you to look at this chart here, and I think it's, I really like this chart because here are girls at the top and boys at the bottom. Um, and I'm going to show you a slide in a minute that actually puts this at age seven. Um, but you can see here that a lot is taking place in terms of puberty development during those tween years, especially for girls, but boys too. Um, and, and puberty, certainly you can see it's, it's, just, it's a process. It takes some time. Um, and we can talk about you know, their primary and secondary ca sex characteristics, which I won't go into. But what I want you to notice here is that a lot is occurring during these early adolescent years and even pre-adolescence. So all of these changes that we're talking about that are triggered by puberty are happening when most kids, 9, 10, and 11. Okay? Um, for boys, even as young as 10, 11, you start to see... And you, those of you who have kids, you know that you may not see all these changes in the voice and all these different things, the hair, but the brains are changing, okay? And it's a lot later that you see, um, you know, the underarm hair, a lot of that. Some of this, especially with boys, you don't even notice because um, their underarm hair and facial hair is one of the last things that happens. So for boys, puberty typically starts between 10 to 13. For girls, as young as 7 to 13. There's been a lot of research lately about how puberty is getting younger. Um, the age of menarche hasn't actually changed that much in the last 50 years, but breast buds are going several years younger. Um, used to be closer to, to 9, and now it's at 7. Um, that's something we can talk, that could be a whole talk um, in and of itself, but probably the most important thing right now is um, how on time you are. So kids who start puberty early are more at risk for a lot of different problems, um, mental health problems, more at risk for doing poorly in school, and a lot of that is because they notice they're different from their peers. And for girls, they're often um, sort of the older boys, like the, the younger girls, and they, that can cause issues, um, precocious behavior. And then the boys who have puberty late, they're starting that growth spurt later, and that can have some negative effects as well. Um, probably the best thing that we can do to keep puberty um, not going any lower is to keep our kids active. It's very related to nutrition and health and body size and weight. And so keeping kids active is really important for um, pubertal development, and also watching exposure to hormones that are in the environment. Um, so the other thing that, in terms of brain and pubertal development that I want to mention is changes in sleep. So puberty also triggers a change in sleep, and that's happening in those tween years. 
melatonin levels, which trigger when we go to sleep and our biological rhythms actually change in, in teens and tweens. Um, they rise later. So it's very natural. Even my child who woke up at 5 every morning will actually sleep until 10. I never thought it would happen. But um, at age 7, the average bedtime is 8. At age 10, it's 9.15. But if you just let teenagers, OK, no restrictions. Go to bed whenever you want. Wake up whenever you want. They go to bed whoops, sorry, at 1 in the morning, and they wake up at 10. That's their natural biological rhythms. So there's some implications, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, but this shift is really important when you think about the effect of sleep on health and mental health. Um, we actually have a study going on at OSU with my colleague, um, Mike Chris and Jennifer Silk at the University of Pittsburgh. And this is with 171 girls. And they're a little older, 12 to 14. Um, it's a very diverse sample. But we asked them about their sleep. And they're not doing too bad. They're on average getting you know, around eight hours a night. They should be getting nine. So that chronic lack of sleep is a problem. But what we found was that, this is not a surprise, kids who are texting, who are using electronics at night, are getting less sleep. But what's really interesting is that number of hours of sleep are related to depressive symptoms. So the less sleep you get, the more likely you are to be depressed. And the less sleep you get, the more likely you are to have poor grades in school. And what I think is also really relevant for the talk today is that this was really true for girls in early puberty. So there's some evidence that getting enough sleep during early puberty, and it needs to be that 9 to 10 hours, um, is really important for grades, for health, um, and also for, you know, just feeling good, you know? And, and think about how when you're sleepy, you're already emotional, and if you're sleepy, you can have even more emotional difficulties and trouble regulating. So um, now we're going to talk a little bit about parenting. But before we do, are there any questions, look through your slides, about brain development? Sure. Everything I've read or heard seems as though kids are going to have mental issues. These are just like in the 20s. All of a sudden, you know, it's just mushrooms. It's just the. Uh, you know. Yeah. So the question is do you see a big change in the 20s? And we do, like schizophrenia is something that comes online in late adolescence, um, early adulthood. Um, you see more alcohol problems, but in general, it's mid-adolescence, even early adolescence when you see depression, you see aggression, and so most of that is actually, in, in fact, you see a big bump um, during adolescence, and then you see it drop off, especially as um, those boys get married, you know, all of a sudden you see less antisocial behavior, um, but you see a rise in alcohol use, you see a rise in delinquency, and all of that is in adolescence, but it is true that schizophrenia, um, in particular, you don't see until a little bit later. So, and that's, yeah, yeah. So it depends on the disorder. Mm -hmm. so why, why is that, what is the brain I don't think we really know, but there are some genetic implications. Certainly with schizophrenia, um, genetics is really involved, and so I think there are some changes that occur. Um, but I don't think we actually know why. But that's something that I know people are studying, and we might know more about as we learn more about the brain. Any other questions about the brain? Yes? Question. Uh, can you tell us a little more about this sensitivity to the fear group? Where that's going on in the brain? Or? Yeah, and there's some great studies um, that we don't have a whole lot of time to get into, but for example, um, when adolescents are playing a game, a video game, where they're um, breaking or running through a yellow light, Okay, um, if there is a peer in the room, they're much more likely to go through that yellow light. If the peer's not in the room, they're going to stop at that yellow light, and they're actually rewarded, you know, if, if, they, if the light doesn't turn red. And what we're finding is it's that reward area, and it actually is more um, heightened, it's more active 
when the peer is in the room. So there's something about the presence of a peer that is increasing that reward sensitivity. And we think that, you know, I mean, there's, some, there's been some really great work. That's why we don't want to have teenagers driving together, because they're much more likely in their effects in the brain. When they have a friend next to them, they're going to be more risky. But at the same time, um, we think it's probably evolutionarily something that when they're at home with their family, it's just maybe not as rewarding, but also something that's wanting them to kind of go out and be a little bit more adventurous when they're around their peers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, <laughs> right, right, I mean, I think that, so Minecraft, how can they sit and play this game all this time? Well, clearly they're finding it rewarding, clearly um, they're getting something out of it, but at the same time, you know, we have to make sure that we're putting those limits, because those sorts of behaviors, if they're getting a lot of reward from them, then they're going to keep doing them, and sometimes we have to put those limits on. Um, yes, Amy. You might go into this, but how, I, you might be getting ready to go into this, but how will parents, I mean, how do we, do we reward them for not doing those things so that it builds that reward center, or do we? Sure, do we yeah. Um, I'll get into that in just a minute, but I think that part of it is we can't necessarily control what is rewarding them. Um, but we can certainly expose them to other things and set limits. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, I want to go ahead, we're going to talk about parenting. I want to start with this video. Um, hopefully you've all seen Inside Out. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Um, what you're going to see in this video um, is a really nice representation of the different emotions in the mom and the daughter and the dad's brain. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about it. So I'm going to go ahead and and start that video. I think I have to do it here. And hopefully our sound will be okay. So, as it turns out, the green trash can is not recycling. It's for greens, like compost and eggshells. Mm. And the blue one is recycling. And the black one is Riley is acting so weird. Why is she acting so weird? Well, how do you expect? All the islands are down. Joy would know what to do. That's it. Until she gets back. We just do what Joy would do. Great idea. Anger, fear, disgust. How are we supposed to be happy? Hey, Riley, I've got good news. I found a junior hockey league right here in San Francisco. And get this, tryouts are tomorrow after school. What luck, right? Hockey? Uh-oh, what do we do? Guys, uh, th th this, uh, here, you, you pretend to be Joy. Wouldn't it be great to be back out on the ice? Oh, yeah, that sounds fantastic. What was that? That wasn't anything like Joy! Uh, because I'm not Joy? Yeah, no kidding. Did you guys pick up on that? Uh, sure. Ooh. Yeah, it's, something's wrong. Should we ask her? Let's probe, but keep it subtle so she doesn't notice. So, how was the first day of school? She's probing us. I'm done. You pretend to be Joy. What? Okay. Um, hmm. It was fine, I guess. I don't know. Oh, very smooth. That was just like Joy. Something is definitely going on. She's never acted like this before. What should we do? We're going to find out what's happening, but we'll need support. Signal the husband. Ahem. With a nice pass oh, over the reed, oh, comes across that right. Ahem. Uh oh, she's looking at us. Uh, what did she say? What? Oh, uh, sorry, sir. No one was listening. Is it garbage night? Uh, we left the toilet seat up. What? What is it, woman? What? <sighs> He's making that stupid face again. I could strangle him right now. Signal him again. Ah, so, Riley, how was school? Seriously? Are you kidding me? Time. For this, we gave up that Brazilian helicopter pilot? Boo, I'll be joy. School was great, all right? Riley, is everything okay? Oh. <sighs> Sir, she just rolled her eyes at us. What is her deal? All right, make a show of force. I don't want to have to put the foot down. No, not the foot. Riley, I do not like this new attitude. Oh, I'll show you attitude. Okay? No, 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 no. Stay happy! What is your problem? Just leave me alone. Sir, reporting high levels of sass. 
Take it to DEFCON 2. You heard that, gentlemen? DEFCON 2. Listen, young lady, I don't know where this disrespectful attitude came from. You want a piece of this, Pops? Come and get it! Yeah, well, well... Here it comes. Prepare the foot. Keys to safety position. Ready to launch on your command, sir. Just shut up! Fire! That's it. Go to your room. Now. Foot is down. The foot is down. Yeah. Good job, gentlemen. That could have been a disaster. Well, that was a disaster. Come, fly with me, Gachinya. about that is it happens. I mean, that is a normal thing to happen. You can tell your child is upset. You ask what's wrong. They don't want to tell you. So you probe. And then they escalate and you escalate and it's sort of a disaster. Um, what I want to really focus on for the last part of the talk is how what we say really does matter. It affects the brain and the behaviors of kids. Um, I also want to talk about how that relationship is changing and how to adapt to those changes, and then a little bit about what the science tells us. So I want to talk a little bit about a study that actually was done here at LIBOR um, with um, Ruben Alvarez and Dr. Robin Aperly. Um, Apperly, and we had um, 12 to 16 year old girls, we had 18 of them, and we put them in the scanner and we played recordings of their mothers. We actually had the mothers record statements. There was a neutral statement, you were born on October 7, 2005, you live at 1601 East 31st Place, that's a neutral statement. There was a critical statement, and we had them use the child's name, Molly. I really don't like it when you fight with your brother. It makes me very angry. Then there was a praise statement. We had them use their name. Molly, I really like how well you work, how hard you work in school. I'm really proud of you. We played these statements, actual mother's recordings while they were in the scanner. And guess what we found? We saw brain responses. What we found was that more anxiety and depressive symptoms were actually related to more amygdala activation, which is the kind of the emotional center of the brain. And we saw more activation in the amygdala um, for criticism and less for praise. And what that means is that when the brain is activated at those levels during those statements, that's more related to anxiety and depressive symptoms. So what is being said is affecting changes in the brain, affecting the way our brains respond, but also that more activation, so kids who are more um, activated, who are hearing these, who are more emotional, are more likely to have depressive and anxiety symptoms. So not only is what we say affecting their brains, but it can have a negative or a positive impact. So remember how I said everyday experiences affect our brain, our brains are constantly changing. Things that we say to our kids are affecting their brains. Okay. Um, I want to talk about a concept, because I think we like to talk a lot as parents. We like to try to tell kids what to do, we like to get them to talk to us. And I've learned, and you can even see that in the Inside Out um, video, that maybe they don't always want to talk. And there's a concept that comes from the program Circle of Security that is called being with. And it's something that doesn't always come natural to intrusive, kind of overprotective parents, or even parents who are concerned and empathic. But it really does work well. And the Circle of Security parenting program 
they talk about this concept and they show the movie, this clip from the movie of Little Miss Sunshine. How many of you have seen Little Miss Sunshine? Okay, I'm not going to show the dance scene, it's really funny. Um, and I'm not going to show the scene, but I'm going to just tell you about it. And if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's a fun movie, kind of different. But in this movie, Dwayne, who's an adolescent, is in the car. It's been kind of a long and stressful family trip. They're in this van that doesn't work very well. They all have to push it. And he realizes that he's colorblind because they, the, you know, all of the little girl shows him a picture. And what happens is he wants to be a, a fighter pilot. And, and the uncle or the dad says, you're colorblind, you can't be a fighter pilot. This has been his, his dream. So this is called, when you Google it, Dwayne's freak out. So Dwayne gets out of the car, he's screaming, they stop the car, he gets out of the car, he runs, he's yelling, all sorts of obscenity, he's so upset, he's yelling, he falls on the ground. Mom comes and tries to talk to him. I mean, he's having nothing. She's like, this isn't working. She leaves, she walks back. And they say, well, Olive, why don't you try? Who's like, she's nine years old, eight or nine. She walks down and just puts her arm around him. And that's that picture there. They sit there for just a few minutes, and then they get up, and they walk back to the van. He's not OK, but he's better. And he's able to get back into the van. And it was this idea of just showing that support. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to give you advice. I'm not going to tell you about, well, you know, when I was a teenager, I found out this, and I wasn't, you know, all my hopes and dreams, um, you know, vanished as well. It was simply being with. Uh, we're going to watch a video about the circle of security, and I'm really pointing this out because I think it's important to think about security during times of transition. It works really well. We were talking earlier, I was talking to Jason back there about toddlers and teenagers having a lot in common. Um, the circle of security is a model of relationships or a model of attachment. And there's an actual circle, you'll see the video in a minute, and the top of the circle represents exploration. So in times of transition, like when we're developing into adolescence, it's natural and normal to want to explore. The bottom of the circle represents nurturance. And so what you want is your kids to go out and explore, but when they need you to come back. That's a healthy relationship. It's actually a healthy marital relationship. It's a healthy friendship. People are doing great on their own, but they need to come back for that nurturance, that sense of security. Um, and what we need to be able to do during adolescence is there's a shift. It used to be whenever kids were crying or upset, mom was there, they're hugging them, they're loving them, they're talking things through. But kids' cues start to change. And in fact, my daughter said to me, mom, can't you read my cues? <laughs> and yes, I could read her cues, I just didn't like them. <laughs> I just wanted her to still want me to talk to her or hug her. Um, but it's a key is to not be too distant, to be there but at the same time not to be overbearing. And realizing that this exploration is a good thing. So let's watch this little video and then we'll talk more about it. Parents, we all wonder if we're getting it right. We want to know we're meeting our children's needs, helping them grow, and giving them all that we can. We try to combine our own experience of being parented with the advice of others and our own instincts and beliefs about what is best. And still, we so often worry that we're not succeeding. In a world that is always offering the next best parenting solution, the circle of security is based on decades of attachment research. Unlike many behavioral perspectives, it offers relationship tools to provide a new way of understanding your children's needs, creating lasting security for them and more satisfaction for you. The circle graphic has been created to help you know what to look for so you can read your children's behavior to guide you in meeting their needs. It's really not complicated People of all ages have attachment needs. 
These needs can be divided in three ways. Let's look at this child. First, he needs to know the freedom and confidence to go out and explore his world. Second, he needs to feel assured that whenever he's ready, he can come back for comfort and protection. Third, he needs his caregiver to be in charge in a kind way. Three basic needs that can be thought of as going out on the circle, coming in on the circle, and hands on the circle. Let's have a look in more detail. Feeling safe and supported, our children want to discover their world. When going out, they need to know that their exploration is encouraged, that we're right there watching over them, delighting in them, offering help when needed, and ready to enjoy their new adventures with them. And when they're coming in, they need us to refill their emotional cup. This means organizing their emotions and letting them know we are delighted to welcome them back, protect, comfort, and understand them. The key for us as parents is to remain strong and kind while knowing when to encourage their going out into the world and how to be available to welcome them back to us. It's crucial that we learn to identify our children's needs like this because misreading them, or worse, missing them altogether, can cause pain and frustration. We all know how uncomfortable it can be to be held too close when we want to be out exploring or kept at a distance when we need emotional support or simply to be without someone who is bigger, stronger, wiser and kind who we can trust to understand what we need when we're feeling lost, confused or out of control. When a child misbehaves, the cause is often rooted in how safe and secure they're feeling. So it's not surprising that they behave well when a parent learns to tune into their child's needs on the circle in this way. And because our needs on the circle never disappear, learning to read cues can help you better understand and meet the needs of people of all ages, including your own. So that's all there is to it. Just know that at any given moment, your child is somewhere on the circle asking you to meet a need. Support my going out. Welcome my coming in. Be the hands that keep me safe by staying in charge and committed to helping me feel connected. And please remember this. There's no such thing as perfect parenting. At Circle of Security, we've come to realize that good enough is, well, good enough. All of us are going to miss needs on the circle time and again. Welcome to the club. But if we meet our children's needs enough of the time, the results will be happier, healthier, more secure children, and parents too. Okay, so I hope you were able to hear that and certainly see the graphics. Um, this idea of attachment is really important because it affects the way that we see the world and it really starts during infancy and is my world safe? Is it predictable? Are my needs being met? Developmentally that changes but at the same time during times of transition, during times where you're experiencing things that are uncertain, you want to still have your children know that their world is safe that their world is predictable as much as it can be and that they can trust others okay but at the same time they need to be exploring so that they're growing um, i think during the tween age period what we find is that tweens we want them to keep coming to us for help but they may not okay and this is normal and okay we need to be able to read their cues. Are we smothering them? Are we just, do they just need our support? Sometimes it's when we're just being with them and hanging out that they tell us things. Maybe it's at night during bedtime when their guard is a little bit down. So we need to be available but not intrusive. And that circle is changing. Um, even though it may be difficult, it's changing. Um, Research supports this as well. So we have several studies that we're doing at OSU of 10 to 18 year olds. We have 206 um, parent teen um, dyads. We have mother, a mother-daughter study, 171. 
Um, we do observation with our um, adolescents and the parents. We do phone interviews every day for two weeks to see how they're feeling and who they're with. We have questionnaires. During the observation, we actually have them discuss a conflict, something that they fight about and come up with a solution. Over and over again, what we're finding in the study is that it's this emotional support. We call it mutual emotional support. It's the connectedness. It's acceptance of each other, it's openness to be able to talk about different things, and then it's what we call relationship quality. During that conflict, are they able to stay positive? Are they able to talk things through? Or are they rolling their eyes? Are they showing a lot of negativity? That emotional support predicts better emotion regulation, less aggression, more pro-social positive behaviors and friendships, and less depression. So that's evidence that, again, it's that support, but it's not telling them what to do, giving them advice. It's mutual. It goes both ways. We actually look at openness from the child to the parent and the parent to the child. It's a relationship. And so the implications here are that, is that that emotional support is really key to positive development. It's one of our best predictors of kids that are doing well in school versus those who are struggling. Before I get into my expert advice, um, are there any questions? Yes. Yes. I've done a lot of uh, reading. I got a name of Stuart Shanker up in British Columbia. Okay. Self regulation. Uh huh. And he's done some really interesting kind of work. And what I like about it is that the parents can't always do this. Right. And so if you, if you are able, Right. Um, there's an opportunity that when you're not there, or if they have, you know, a, a conflict with their teacher or somebody, mm -hmm. that, that, uh, there's that opportunity, and the kids can get up to the rest of the world. Right. When so you're not there. I think that's a really important point because one of the things that really um, we see in adolescence, and it's more as kids get older into adolescence, is they're with their family less. And so um, you see that even in school. So what you want as parents is to enable them. That's that safe exploration so that they have the tools to be able to regulate themselves to make good decisions when you're not around. What that means is internalizing that. That's not learned through punishment. It's learned through discussions. It's learned through perspective taking. It's learned through things like being able to calm yourself down by breathing, you're talking about a belly breath. Um, but again, teaching those things, and, and you really want to start that much earlier than the teenage years. Um, but you're right, because it becomes key because you're with them less. And then you even want to do practical things like give them an out. If something's going on and you're uncomfortable, call me and tell me that you're sick. You know, I mean, you need to be able to allow them to come back in a way. Um, that is safe for them. Let me go ahead and, and get through my expert advice here so we have some more time for questions. But I want to talk about my experts. I mentioned earlier that these are the kids who I did carpool with um, over this week. Um, and we had six tweens, uh, several girls and several boys. And I asked them, what is your advice for parents? And I think the first two are, are great. Leave us alone. Spend time with us, okay? Um, talk with us, but in private. Uh, let us be on our own. Give us orders and chores, but make us think it's our choice. <laughs> if, if only, I don't know how to do that, but if anybody has any ideas. Um, let us do things on our own. Talk to us, but not too much. And I think this represents that circle. When I heard all this, I thought, this is a circle of security. You know, spend time with us, but leave us alone, right? Be there when you need us. Um, this is an, was another key theme. Don't embarrass us, OK? You see a big change. I was listening to a TED Talk. You said the difference they could tell when their kids were adolescents is it used to be when they were acting up in a grocery store, the dad would threaten to sing their favorite song. Um, 
or, and they would all love it. I'll sing your favorite song if you stop acting up in the grocery store. They would stop. And then it became, if you don't act, if you stop, um, if you don't calm down, if you keep acting up, I'm going to sing your favorite song. That was a threat <laughs> instead of a reward. And they were like, OK, we'll stop. Um, they get embarrassed easy. And uh, in fact, someone said, don't tell baby stories about us, especially around our friends. And then I like this, don't embarrass yourself. <laughs> don't try to be cool. I think I've fallen into that before, trying to be like the cool mom. Um, but they really are sensitive, you know, and it's overly, their kind of, their brains are like, oh my gosh, my mom is doing something different. My kid, friends are going to notice. Um, give us space. I like this one too. Family nights are good, but family meetings are not. And I really thought about this. And what they said was it's because we know what you're going to tell us and it's really awkward. Um, don't make a big deal of things. Um, we know what you're going to say. If you make a big deal, it makes it worse. So it's more like these natural conversations, but they wanted to spend time. They said vacations, game nights, movie nights, all of those things are good. So, you know, Kids want you to spend time with them. It shows that you care. And particularly during the tween periods, they're not as busy. They're not driving yet. Um, but let's not smother them, because we don't want them to not want to do that. I asked them also, uh, what's it like to be a tween? How is it different from when you were younger? The first one was kind of weird. I mean, they're going through these changes. There's more pressure. Um, girls are more mature than boys. Both boys and girls agreed. <laughs> girls are more, well, I mean, the girls go through puberty two years earlier. It's more stressful. There's more pressure. Care, parents care more about grades. So, you know, they're feeling all of this. Um, they said you care more about your, what your friends think. You worry more about what your friends think. Friends are important, but family is more important. And I asked that, can you all agree? Yes. Friends are important, but family is more important. I don't know if they will say that when they're adolescents. Hopefully, but the point is we still make a big impact. They still want to do the game nights. They still want to have, fa have family time. And this was interesting. Um, I said, well, how is it do you think it's different than like when I was younger? And they said, well, you have to have your phone all the time, and it gets really tiring. Um, what if we could just take a break from our phones for one or two days a year? And I thought, well, their point is that it's this stress, it's this pressure that they always have to be connected. And they really, there's a desire for them to sort of unplug. Even though that's hard for them, that's where we need to kind of come in. Um, so in terms of, I'd like to just take a few minutes to, to talk about this and to get impact from the group or input from the group. What themes you see and what is sort of this takeaway statement from what they're saying and what we've been talking about tonight? Any thoughts? There's a push-pull, yeah. Ruth, you were going to say something. I definitely, the push-pull and the, the um, putting together the importance of what friends think and the pressure, I'm thinking about the constant presence of the phone and staying connected. That pressure would be always there. Yeah. I could see why it would be tiring, but I never thought about that before. Yeah, so that constant pressure and always having it there, always having that phone there, feeling like you need to know what's going on, that's even exacerbating that pressure. It's keeping them up at night, right? Literally. Other thoughts? Yes. 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 One. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, the way you want to approach something like that is to always say, in, in a discussion, you know, like, and, and that families need to have rules, um, and we, it's important for everybody to put, and, and in our home, we all put the phone away, um, but yeah, parents are going to have to do that. I think particularly during these early teenage years, it's really important. I know as kids get older, sometimes they're actually doing their homework, and they're texting about their homework. What are they texting about? But I think parents do need to put, put those limits on because otherwise they're going to be on their phone all night. They're going to be creating that pressure. They're going to feel 
what you find is that kids, even though they say they don't like rules, they really secretly do. It makes them feel more safe, more secure, life is more predictable, and kids who don't have rules, you know what they say about their parents? They don't care. So even though they say they don't want rules, they really do. And that's kind of our job. And so I think the phone is actually a pretty big one that we need to regulate. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And you're right. In fact, there was a study that was recently done. Oxytocin is what they call the cuddle hormone. We release it, um, you know, when we pet our dogs during sex. I mean, it's it. It we now release oxytocin when we when our with our phone. I mean, so it, that's in adults. So you're right. So there's this biological thing that's going on that you're having to fight against, and we know that's even stronger. That reward center is even stronger. So the kids are getting that reward for those pings, and literally it's the ping, you know, that you hear, you have a text, and they can't wait to go look at it. Um, that's what you're fighting. I mean, I want to look at my text when it goes off, but that's probably even stronger for them. So the, so. So the, the coping mechanism or the, the counteraction for that is to introduce some other experience. It helps with getting some other reward to distract and decide from that. I mean, what what is Right. What's the counter? I think that, I mean, first of all, you have to put limits because we all want to eat all the time and do all these, I mean, normally, right? We like to reward ourselves. So you're fighting against that. So we have to have rules and limits. But at the same time, you know, finding out what's, what's appropriate fun, spending time with your friends. Sports is a great thing. Activities, you know, keeping kids busy. Um, not necessarily in front of the TV, but you know, relax. Having some relaxing downtime is good too. Um, it's hard to get those thrills other ways, but sometimes playing video games with your friends, those sorts of things. I think all of that's totally fine. You just need everything has to be in moderation. You know what we do, which is probably not going to be great for very much longer. But when the phone goes away, we do a game like we play. Smart yeah, I think good. that's great. I, I mean, like tonight, probably they'll say that's really dorky. We can't do that anymore. <laughs> Looking constantly for the next, like, we only do this at night. Right. Are gone. It's I think that you're, it's surprising how rewarding that can be. So we went away for a week to go skiing, and I had four tweens, and we played games every night, and they loved it. They just loved it. We didn't even turn on the TV, and the phones didn't work where we were. And, you know, I, I think we forget about that interaction. And I was surprised that they, wa they wanted to play more than I did. You know, I mean, they were really into it. So even things like Uno, which, you know, <laughs> I find kind of boring, but um, they loved it. So I think you're right. Trying to have something else, that things to look forward to. Um, I want to recap and then have a little bit more time for questions, and then I have just a, a little bit left at the end to talk about a study that we're doing here. Um, so the recap, obviously, that um, the tween period, we see major changes in body development, um, brain development, and that this can be stressful for both tweens and for parents. But tween years are also a time of connection and separation. And so I think we have to really enjoy the connection, make the most of it, and be okay with the separation. Um, remembering that tweens need and want support, and then this idea of being with. I um, shared that with my husband, who really likes this idea of just being, hanging out. And I think sometimes dads may naturally be better at it. You know, just being there. You don't have to say anything. It's OK to be quiet. This concept, I think, is really important during this developmental period. Um, and then some practical things, helping our kids get enough sleep. That's really important, something we can do, setting limits and making time for um, any other questions, comments? Yes. Have you talked to your tweens about sex, alcohol, and drugs? I have. So um, I think that's um, interesting because I talked a little bit about that in the car this morning. Um, 
you have to have those conversations often and early about sex, alcohol, and drugs. And you don't want to have the talk because they just said, we hate family meetings, you know. I mean, you don't want to make a big deal of it. You want to regularly be open and regularly have these conversations. If, um, and what, what the girls told me in the car today is that the 12-year-old the girls, they're already talking about it anyway. The boys, they said they all know about it, but they don't talk about it except for silly, in silly ways. But the point is, if you don't talk about it, their friend is going to. And so, and there's a lot of bad information out there. And now, all they have to do is Google sex on their phone. And, you know, those parental controls, they work on your computer, but they don't always work on your phone, especially if you're not in the home. So, you've got to have those talks often and early. Yeah. It's really important. Uh-huh. Come back to the texting. When I had tweens and was the uh, uh -huh. carpool person, they didn't talk because they were texting each other. In the car. Exactly. Are there research studies on how that lack of actual talking is affecting the brain development because they are doing so much digitally? Yeah. Um, you know, all of that work is really new, but there are some studies that are showing that kids are losing some of that social development about reading cues, you know how we're nodding our heads, we're looking at each other in the face, they're losing some of that because there's not that face-to-face -face interaction. They're all breaking up over text. I mean, they may even be going out but never do anything but text each other, right, when they're at this age. Right, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I, but I do think taking the phone away and talking about that are some things that we can do. We're, this research is still really new. I think we'll learn a lot more. I'm gonna tell you about a study that we're doing. But you're right. I mean, the only way to get better socially is to practice. Uh huh. Do you have any suggestions on discipline for tweens? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think for disciplines for tweens, you know, the best thing that you can do is sort of what we would call a logical consequence. Um, one of the girls said, My parents don't have a bedtime for me but they tell me that I'll be sleepy if I don't go to bed, and I go to bed now because I learned the hard way. Um, I don't know that that would work for everyone. You have to know your child. Um, um, taking away that phone, if, they, if they're not interacting with their family, if they can't get along with their siblings, then they don't need to be interacting with others socially. So, um, but always talking it through, always trying to explain to them, you know, what is the point here, what, is the, what are you trying to internalize here? Um, and then I think the other thing that's really important is are we modeling what we're trying to be teaching? So maybe they're being sassy. Here comes the sass, right? Did you hear that in the, here comes sass. And, but are we being sassy to them? Are we being disrespectful to them? And so always thinking and modeling the kind of behavior that you would like in a relationship. I think that's important. But the best thing they all said in the car, I asked them, my son said, go get a, a switch, which was hilarious because he's never had a switch, but it was a joke. But um, <laughs> they also take away your, our phone. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it works. But it's taking, it's like grounding because that's their social connection. Yeah, so. Any other questions? Yes. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. And so what we found during that criticism is that you had more heightened activity um, if you were more prone, that more heightened activity is more prone to depression and anxiety. And so I think it's not only tone of voice, um, it's the content, and we don't know exactly how or what, but it's certainly you're seeing this activation in the brain and that that is related to mental health. Um, we saw some differences in terms of laterality, um, and I think one thing that's really important is we saw less response to praise. And I think that that's interesting because, you know, um, in terms of depression research, it's not just feeling sad, it's a lack of feeling 
positive feelings, happiness, and joy. And so if your brain isn't responding to that praise, that's another indication that something is wrong. And so all of this develops over time, over these patterns, but I think it's not just the, its tone of voice, its content, but all of that is affecting those emotional centers of the brain. And so that's also why when you say something to your child and they explode, it's, it, they're, they're, that center of their brain is so active. It's so, um, there's some evidence that the nucleus accumbens is even more, is bigger and enlarged during adolescence, which is that reward center. It's that emotion processing. So, you know, when I get, when you get upset or say something, you're going to have a stronger reaction. Does that answer it? Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's the, the, the response, to, you know, this was specifically looking at how that relates to depression and anxiety symptoms, but they do see a response to praise, but not as much as the criticism. You know, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh -huh. What about the um, kids with anxiety disorders? So is it maybe even bigger? Right, so with an anxiety disorder, uh, again, I think you can see that that heightened anxiety during adolescence with that social pressure, you can see how um, that, you know, overly um, active emotional system can kind of lead and exacerbate anxiety problems as well. So I think that, you know, there are individual differences in all of these things, but kids who are more prone to that, parents have to be even more sensitive and even help them to develop even more safety and security and help them to develop those skills for self-regulation. And there is so much pressure that we're sort of inducing anxiety in these kids if we're not careful. All right, let me go on and just finish up my talk and um, tell you about one more thing and then um, I'll be up here for more questions later. But I wanna tell you about our ABCD study. You might have seen some flyers out there um, it's the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study that we're doing here at Liber. And this is our little driller. You guys might recognize him. And um, these are the investigators who are part of this study. We are partnering with TU, OSU, and OU. But this is the largest study ever. Um, it's a landmark study of 12,000 healthy children. We're targeting nine and 10 year old kids, and we will be following them for 10 years into adulthood. And we will have 600 kids here in Tulsa. And you can see this study has 19 sites across the United States, one in Hawaii, um, and we'll all be studying kids over time. This is just now, now that we have fMRI, we have this ability to look at how brains change over time. Most studies of brain development are just looking at kids, one child at a certain age. We'll be able to follow the same child throughout adolescence. And we have a lot of investigators across the country. This is funded by the National Institutes of Health. It's $28 million per year for five to 10 years across sites. So it's a really well-funded study, but it's very intensive too. We're looking at the development of the brain over time. We're looking at standards of development. We're also looking at risk and protective factors for development, substance use, risky behavior, academic success, sports, family activity, how that affects the brain during adolescence as well. So this is my pitch. Um, we are trying to get our word out in the community that we're looking for these 600 8 to 10 year olds, they can be in the study once they turn 9, to be part of this landmark study. And my daughter was a, a, one of our first pilots. And it's really an interesting experience for them. We do a brain scan every other year in the study. And they get to answer surveys and questionnaires. So they learn a lot about science in the brain. They get a picture of the brain. And they're compensated, the family's compensated $200 to $400 a year because it's fairly intensive. It's a, it's a um, multiple day um, session. So it's about eight hours total um, on the brain scan years. Um, here's just a graphic and it's in your packet of sort of what happens at the different developmental periods. We do surveys, we collect saliva, um, that'll give us some information about um, their, their stress and their genetics. 
Um, and part of this is we're trying to get out into the community and do these Healthy Brains, um, Healthy Oklahoma uh, talks, but also we want to tell people about the ABCD study and as findings come online, we want to let people know about it. Um, we had our first talk back in March, actually it's March now, um, back in February, and Dr. Paulus talked about how the brain grows up. It was a great talk, hopefully he'll give it again if you missed it. But we also have another talk coming up in April and Kyle Simmons will be talking about healthy body, healthy brain. Uh, I think it's going to be great. He'll be talking more about sleep, about nutrition, about exercise. So I encourage you to come to that as well. Um, any questions before we, we end? Questions, comments, thoughts? Shelly. Right. Right. So the natural sleep cycle from 1 to 10, you know, that's one of the things, I don't think we can really reverse that. I mean, you can do things trying to make it dark. Screen time actually activates those lights are not good. So trying to kind of make things dark, get them the screen away, have them just read and quiet light. That can help get them sleepy. Avoiding sugar and caffeine, all of that's really important too. But I think that's one of the things that Tulsa Public Schools actually does really well, is that they start later, um, and it, that extra hour makes a huge difference. It's not like that in all schools, but I do think many schools, and you've seen this, and it's directly because of the research, have shifted back their start times in middle school and high school because of this research. So, you know, talk to your school about changing the time if they haven't, um, but at the same time, Realizing they can catch up with sleep on the weekends, I mean, that's good to let them sleep in, but at the same time, it's best if you can get a regular bedtime. It really is. But it's hard. But you can at least kind of start, you know, everybody in the house turning down the lights, turning off the electronics. I mean, those sorts of things can help. And then hopefully you can kind of adjust that system. But even then, okay, you have to be in your room at 10, read until you go to bed. Sometimes they can't fall asleep until 11. And I mean, and it's hard. Yeah. You remember that too? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. Any other questions? I'll be here for a little while if anybody has more questions, but thank you guys all for coming. Really appreciate it.